So we had been talking about um, grain sizes, and um, we, we'd, we'd seen that grain sizes influence the um, transformation, Oops, the grain size of austenite. We had also seen that um, a grain size control is a way to control the strength in the sense that when you get lower grain size, you have increase in the yield strength and very often also tensile strength, you'll ultimate tensile strength. And uh, we'll see later as we, we talk about uh, products, plate products in particular, uh, that uh, smaller grain sizes are very beneficial for toughness. All right, so and I already told you that um, in, um, in practice, uh, very often, we will uh, control grain size uh, in steel products by uh, trying to do thermomechanical um, processing of, of steel. And uh, I told you that, so in, in, uh, with normal steels, the, you, you, you do, you can reduce the, the, the grain size um, but not very much so. And, we, and I had shown to you when you uh, take conventional steel, hmm, you will have, due to the in deformation, let's say that this is, uh, these are uh, rolling passes, for instance, due to the deformation and subsequent between the rolling passes, recrystallization, you get some grain refinement. Hmm? But at high temperature, the recrystallization is very fast and grain growth is also very fast in the austenite. So the amount of refinement you can get is relatively limited. Hmm? Uh, what, what does this mean? Well, you cannot go much lower than 10 to 15 micron grain sizes. Right, I also told you that as, as you move very close to the transformation temperature, very close, you, you get into a, a temperature range where we, that we call the non-recrystallization uh, temperature region. Hmm? It's very narrow. You can't really exploit this area because um, it's much too close to the transformation. Hmm? So what happens if, if you have these coarse grains, austenite recrystallizes, and then you get the transformation. You get ferrite grains that will be in your product uh, are coming from recrystallized austenite and they grow at the grain boundaries of the austenite. Hmm? Okay, all right. So, um, so what's the picture uh, during this uh, uh, mechanical and structural transformation that you get in the, for instance, rolling passes. You, for instance, here you have a grain. The, this grain is, when you, you pass through a rolling uh, mill, you get uh, pancaking because the grain gets flattened, yes, and elongated. Yeah? Um, so that's mechanical deformation. And then because you're at high temperature, you get recrystallization. And this recrystallization can be even dynamic recrystallization. That means that during the deformation, yes, the grain already uh, transforms to a new grain with very low dislocation density. So if the strain is high enough, you can get dynamic recrystallization. And then you get between the passes, yes, strip is at high temperature, yes, and uh, you get static recrystallization at high temperature, and then grain growth. Yes, this is very fast. Yeah? And then the next uh, rolling step, you get again the same process you had here. In this rolling step, uh, you get pancaking, flattening of the grains. And then if the strain's large enough, we can get dynamic recrystallization also. Hmm? So th and these processes are very e effective, very efficient, goes very quickly. Hmm? So um, the time here uh, uh, between rolling passes can be as, as uh, certainly 
uh, for instance, in a rolling mill, a hot, roll, a hot strip mill, towards the end of the finisher, this, this, uh, the time between two deformation passes is of the order of one second or less. Yes? And, but even then, the, the steel will recrystallize and, and, and there will be some grain growth. Okay? So, so this is what happens if, I, if we make a plot here. Hmm, you have, this is the plot of the static recrystallization kinetics, so that's very fast. And then uh, once the recrystallization is finished, you get grain growth. Okay? In, and that happens in the interpass region. Now what happens when we, um, uh, when we do um, control the, um, the grain size, hmm, uh, what we need to do first is we need to add elements that will prevent the recrystallization. So when, when, you, when you have, uh, not prevent it, but um, slow down the recrystallization. So when you have a recrystallization, yes, what basically happens is you have a recrystallization front yeah, going from a region with very low dislocation region, uh, very low dislocation density to a region with very high dislocation, yes? So you need to have this interface slowed down, yes? And you, th this is done by having, by adding niobium. Because niobium, um, solute niobium, causes an effect called uh, solute drag, yes? slows down this interface. Yes, if this interface slows down, yes, um, this boundary slows down rather, um, you can basically slow down the recrystallization kinetics. Okay? And so niobium does that, and in practice what it means is that this, this region of non-recrystallization, yes, when you add, the temperature increases. Yes? So that you have here a wide open non-recrystallization region. Yes? And uh, very often we add some additional manganese so that the AR3 temperature drops down. Yes? And you have a large region of what we call non-recrystallization. Yes? And you, you can then deform the material yes? in this non-recrystallization region. So the grains will get pancaked they will not recrystallize, and they will pancake again. No recrystallization, pancake again. So you get a lot of strain accumulated in the austenite, yes? And so you have these deformed gamma grains with deformation bands in the gamma grains. And then when you get to the transformation, the ferrite transforms not from recrystallized austenite, but from deformed, and you get a considerable grain refinement. So and I've already shown you this picture, no, no strain ferrite uh, nucleates at grain boundaries. When you have strain, you've got a lot more very high nucleation rate. Hmm? So this is the picture we had in without, say, niobium, <coughs> without this the solute drag effect, very fast recrystallization and then, grain, and then grain growth. If we have a high temperature of non-recrystallization, you really don't stop the recrystallization. What you, what you do is you slow it down. So now the kinetics of recrystallizations, of, of uh, static uh, recrystallization now looks like this S-curve here, yes? And that means that your grains are pancake. There is a little, little bit of recrystallization, but before the structure is recrystallized, you deform it again. Right? Okay. And so that's the way you accumulate uh, this uh, straining and, and, and reduction of the grain size. So, so if you look in a, the processing of a conventional carbon manganese steel that doesn't contain any niobium, hmm? so this would be the temperature of rolling. So you go from somewhere 1150 to close to 900, right, above the AR3 temperature, yes? And you look at the grain diameter. So in the conventional situation, every time you have a rolling pass, yes, 
you have a reduction in the grain size. Yes? At the beginning, you have very, very coarse grain sizes, so uh, uh, you don't really uh, notice the recrystallization uh, too much. But below 100 micron, you can see you reduce the grain size, and then in between the passes, you have grain growth. Reduce the grain size, grain growth. Yes. So eventually, you end up with something that's pretty coarse, the austenite. 50 microns. In the microalloyed case, yes, every time you reduce, you do, you, you reduce the, uh, the thickness of your sheet, yes, you also reduce the grain size, yes. But there is no recrystallization and there's certainly no grain growth. So you can accumulate the strain and you end up with grain sizes which are less than 20 microns. When you transform this, yes, your ferrite grain size is uh, considerably uh, uh, smaller. Hmm? So the explanation for the um, slowing down of the um, recrystallization, the fact, uh, you, 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 of course you have to remember this is a process that happens at 900 thousand degrees, right? So that's high temperature. Um, after the transformation has occurred, you know, this original microstructure at high temperature is not visible anymore, yes? And also, the niobium uh, solubility in ferrite is much, much slower than the niobium solubility in austenite. So the structure you look you, you can see at room temperature, where you would make your observation, is very different than what is at, you have at high temperature. So as a consequence, it's difficult to check the theories, different theories for this uh, grain size refinement. There is an alternative theory for this um, uh, niobium, the effect of the niobium, and that is um, a deformation enhanced precipitation. Yes? It, it, it says basically that when you uh, have a lot of strain, the niobium carbide can precipitate yes? and form very tiny precipitates. Yes? And it is these pre precipitate, excuse me, rather than the solute niobium that has uh, an effect on the motion of this boundary. Anyway. Whatever the, uh, uh, the explanation, it appears that it's very important to have niobium there, yes, in solution when you're doing the, the rolling. One of the things that um, uh, people ha have noticed is that this process of niobium carbide precipitation is definitely uh, enhanced, high, much higher kinetics, than if there is no deformation. This is an example here. Um, right, so it, it, uh, it shows you the recrystallization kinetics for uh, steel, and here the precipitation kinetics for niobium carbide in recrystallized um, austenite. So when you deform a material, yes, a steel at high temperature, yes, you have recrystallization kinetics. And how do I represent this? Well, I make measurements at a certain temperature at certain temperatures, yes, of the recryst of the amount of recrystallization as a function of time. Yeah? Just like I would do for transformations. Yeah? So, and obviously at high temperature, my recrystallization time will be short. Yeah? And as I drop the temperature, the recrystallization time will be longer. Yeah? So, so say these points are observations of where the recrystallization starts, yes? So this would be recrystallization start temperature or times, yes? And this would be, for instance, recrystallization ends here, okay? This is the region of recrystallization. So this, this gives me, 
This, this explains why recrystallization kinetics um, uh, data looks like this. You have a, um, basically a line for start of the recrystallization and a line for the uh, end of the recrystallization. So you can see here that, for instance, at 900 degrees C, yes, the end of the recrystallization is between 1 to 10 seconds. Yes? So very short. Um, good. So let's, say, let's have a look at the precipitation now of niobium carbide in recrystallized austenite. So there's no deformation, and uh, it's a, what we call a nucleation and growth phenomenon. So you get precipitation curves that are usually a little bit C-shaped, and, and here you have a line where the, 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 the precipitation starts, yes? And here you have a line where the precipitation is finished. Now let's look at the x-axis, the time. This, is, this was seconds, this is hours. So it takes about an hour to get the niobium carbide to precipitate in, in austenite normally. Yes. However, if we have deformed austenite, yes, this is what we see. First of all, the recrystallization, yes, the recrystallization instead of going straight down has a, a bay. So there is around 900 degrees C, the recrystallization is severely suppressed, very strongly suppressed. And the other thing we see is that the precipitation of niobium carbide is tremendously enhanced. So now instead of having a five, uh, instead of having to wait for minutes or hours to get any appreciable ni niobium carbide precipitation, now it only takes a few seconds or less. Yes? So this model that uh, what causes the suppression of the uh, recrystallization kinetics of deformed austenite by uh, microscopic nano-sized uh, niobium carbide particles is very uh, plausible also. Okay? So uh, here, here you actually have some, um, so, some data here. You see here the static precipitation of niobium carbide and this is the deformation-induced precipitate. And you can see, for instance, in this case, um, for the start, it takes about 100 seconds. And, and if you do this in deformed material, it takes about one second to start. And the, uh, the, peak, the, the peak precipitation is around 900. Yeah. Okay. So when you are uh, rolling, also, the, the uh, uh, you, you're rolling this uh, austenite, so you deform it, and you can keep on deforming it. It doesn't recrystallize. It also means that when you do the transformation, yes, the transformation is now from recrystallized austenite. Oh, sorry, um, excuse me, not non-recrystallized austenite. So you remember from. Um, I guess uh, Tuesday, that when you uh, transform from non-recrystallized austenite, you have two effects. You have many more nucleations, nucleation uh, sites, and the other effect is you have more driving force. So as a consequence, the um, transformation kinetics, yes, yes, the transformation kinetics so instead of being like this for a niobium free steel, you now have enhanced kinetics. So the, 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 yes, the C curve for the ferrite nucleation is, uh, moves um, to the left. So, you, so when you cool, you get lots of nucleation, yes? And then we'll see that uh, you get a change in the cooling rate when, uh, in, when you have stripped products, when you coil them, okay? But the important thing here is that you have enhancement of the transformation kinetics. So uh, let, let's be very clear, right? It's 
the recrystallize, recrystallization is suppressed, but the transformation is enhanced, right? Okay, there's, there's no uh, contradiction here, right? Okay, let's... Uh, right, so um, usually um, you may be or will be told that uh, you have as a micro alloying uh, additions, you have niobium, you can have titanium, you can have vanadium, yes? Uh, and that is correct to a certain extent, but these additions ha are very different in their behavior, yes? Um, and so you cannot replace niobium with titanium or vanadium, yes? And, uh, wh well, why is that? Well, one of, one of the reasons is the, they have different solubilities, yes? And they have different stabilities, yeah? So, so first of all, here about the uh, uh, stability. So if you look at the um, free energy of formation, yes, delta G, you see that um, you have uh, titanium nitride, it's very strong. Uh, then comes niobium nitride. Then you've got a series of nitrides and carbides that are equivalent. Yes. And then you have a much uh, less um, stable vanadium carbide. That means that um, you will have very different uh, behavior. So in general, what we see is that uh, if delta G, the delta G of the compound is very negative, so you have a ver obviously a very stable compound, but it also has a very low solubility in steel. Yeah. The other hand, compounds on this side are of course less stable, yes, and they have higher solubility also. So if we use now information we have about solubility, yes, we can actually have a look at how efficient certain microalloy additions will be yes, to obtain grain refinement. Okay? So again, if we think about this model, that the grain refinement is due to the suppression of recrystallization as a consequence of precipitate formation, yes, small precipitation formation, or strain-induced precipitate formation, you would want to have precipitation during rolling, during the formation, okay? So, so let's look at what this diagram shows us. It shows us the temperature uh, where you do the, the processing and the precipitation fraction, right? So if, if, if for instance, let, let's look at the blue line here, it means that um, nothing, so it's, it, we're looking at niobium carbide with up to uh, this point, yes, this temperature, nothing has precipitated. And if we reduce the temperature, the niobium carbide becomes, starts to precipitate, okay? And so, uh, let's look at this blue niobium carbide uh, curve first. It's calculated. You, you know, of course, that the precipitation will depend on the composition of the steel. That means the, the carbon content, the niobium content, and the temperature, right? So this is what, you what we, sh we show here. For 400 ppm niobium, 0.1% of carbon. That's a typical composition you will have in these microalloyed steels. Yeah. You see that the precipitation starts here, increases, and is about complete around 900 degrees C. Yes? And this overlaps exactly, yes, with the rolling temperature range that we apply industrially, right? So this process will be very efficient, okay? 
Let's look at vanadium carbide. Yes? Not vanadium nitride. Let's look at vanadium carbide. So here you have a steel. We calculate the precipitation hmm, of vanadium carbide for 0.12% vanadium, 0.1% of carbon. Yes? What do we see? Doesn't precipitate, doesn't precipitate, it precipitates here. It precipitates after the rolling. So there's not going to be interaction between the rolling and the precipitation of vanadium carbide. Hmm? So vanadium carbide itself has no impact on the, uh, doesn't really cause thermomechanical uh, refinement, grain refinement. For, for that, you need to have a nitride of vanadium. Yes? So here you have uh, 0.12 vanadium. Yes, the same amount of vanadium. Um, and 100 ppm of nitrogen. 100 ppm of nitrogen, for your information, is a high nitrogen content. Yes? Usually, we don't have that much nitrogen in our steels. Yeah? And we don't like to have that much nitrogen in our steels because it gives us a lot of very sensitive, makes the steels very sensitive to aging. They age very quickly. So, uh, but do, we do use this. We, we use this in when we have certain metallurgies, hmm, steel making metallurgies, will, which give us, which always give us high nitrogen. For instance, when you produce um, steels uh, in electric arc furnace using scrap, the nitrogen content tends to be high. And, and, and so that would be an ideal way to, um, to do microalloying. Yes? So many mills will tend to use vanadium microalloying additions very often. Um, is titanium nitride, we, we're talking about nitride, so is titanium nitride a good addition? Yes? Well, there, it's just the reverse. Here we have, say, uh, let's look at the, the lower red line, 0.02% uh, titanium, 100%, uh, 100 uh, ppm of nitrogen, you see that the precipitation of titanium nitride is finished before you, you reach the rolling range. So same thing. The titanium nitride will not have a large effect or any effect on the, uh, uh, will not cause thermomechanical grain refinement yeah, as efficiently as the niobium carbide does. Okay. The, as I, as I said, uh, these uh, carbides uh, need to be uh, in the right range in terms of size and in terms of uh, density. Mm -hmm. So there are theories of precipitation hardening, and um, these theories give you the increase in the strength, yes, as a function of precipitate volume fraction for different particle um, sizes. Yeah? And the HSLA steels or the microalloy steels, high strength low alloy steels or microalloy steels, we see that the best uh, uh, strengthening is achieved at about uh, five nanometers, yes, five nanometers, 0. 0.005 microns. So they've got to be really fine to, to give me precipitation hardening. So the addition of niobium, titanium, vanadium, yes, have, has two effects. Effect number one is to refine the grain. Effect number two is due to the presence of the precipitates. Right? So you have precipitation hardening. So you have two effects okay? when you do the microalloying. And so that's one of the reasons why 
when you add niobium to a steel, you can still, you, the, uh, the amount of grain refinement may be limited, but you can still get strengthening as a consequence of the precipitation, yeah? the presence of the, the vanadium carbide precipitates. Okay? In many cases, however, yes? Let's go back just uh, to the slide we just had. In many cases, however, you can see here um, on this graph, we typically have about 10 to the minus 3 in volume fraction, yes? And, uh, and we have uh, the particle sizes that we can achieve are usually between 10, 5 and 10 nanometers. So somewhere here, yes? So usually the strengthening that we can achieve uh, will not be higher than 100, mi uh, 100 megapascal. Very often it's less, yes? But that's not too much of a problem because you get the extra strengthening also from the grain refinement. And so very often, um, and certainly when we, we use niobium, most of the strengthening does not come from precipitation hardening, but comes from grain refinement. Yeah? So this is shown here. Uh, it's basically uh, what you see here uh, is a hull uh, patch uh, plot. So you have the yield strength as a function of 1 over the square root of the grain size. And you, you, you see the, uh, upward, um, so the, 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 the straight line, so it, you know, and the grain size is smaller. So you, in this direction here, you can see the scale with microns. So if you, you go uh, to lower grain sizes, you have an increase in the yield strength. Yes? What you see is that the niobium steels, yes, can do two things. First of all, they're slightly shifted upwards. That's the impact of the precipitation strength. And then they're shifted to the right, yes? Now you could, you know, there's no reason why you, the carbon manganese steel couldn't achieve the same amount of strength. The trouble is you cannot refine the grain in those steels, yes? Hmm? Uh, you see, the, with the HSLA steel, you can get grain sizes which are of the order of five microns. Yes. Typically, uh, run-of-the-mill microalloy steels will have between seven to five microns in grain size. Yes. And and you can see that um, the, the 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 strength increase is appreciable. You get um, you know with carbon manganese steels, yield strengths, 350 maybe. HSLA steel. 500 and more, okay? And the amount of alloying elements you add is very small, right? It's just, you know, the order of 400 ppm. So you don't have to add huge amounts of, yes? Yeah. The other advantage is that you achieve these strengths by reducing the grain size, yes? Rather than increasing the amount of carbon. Yes, and this brings us to the next point. Oh, yeah. First, let me let me show you how uh, some intricacies. Um, so, so where does this actually happen? You know, where where do you where is this processing of thermomechanical controlled processing of HSLA steels done? Right. So, so. Um, we'll see um, in uh, some, some future lectures how a uh, hot strip mill looks like in detail, but you basically have a slab reheating furnace, a roughing mill, and a finishing mill. And, and, and it's in this finishing mill that you do the th basically the thermomechanical processing. Hmm? So the, you choose the temperature of the furnace high enough so that all your carbides of niobium are in solution. Yeah. And you keep them in solution 
until you reach the finishing mill. Yes? There you do rolling between 1,000 and 900 degrees C. Yes? And that's where you achieve the pancaking. Yeah? Strain accumulation of the, um, uh, in the austenite. And strain-induced precipitation of the niobium carbide. That's what you get in, this, um, in the finishing mill. Then you, you, you go on the runout table. This is where you, you carry out the, the austenite to ferrite phase transformation, yes? Mm -hmm. And in the coil, yes, when you coil the material, whatever niobium carbide was not precipitated will now precipitate at lower temperatures in the ferrite phase. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in uh, so, so, so now let's, let's look at the temperature and position, yes? So in a conventional situation, yes, the slab comes out of the reheating furnace, goes into the, the roughing, the finisher, yes? Usually the TNR in the, for a conventional situation, conventional steel, the TNR is, is less is very close to the transformation temperature. So you, you can only achieve that temperature basically at the end of your finisher. Mm -hmm. okay. And then you have the transformation from ferrite, from austenite to ferrite, yes. And as I said, this transformation will be from recrystallized austenite. So you'll have very few nucleation, very little nucleation here of the ferrite at the austenite grain boundaries. And then when you coil the material, you get pretty coarse microstructures. If you now look at the processing, yes, the processing for a thermomechanically uh, uh, processing, so niobium uh, added steels, now your TNR, yes, your temperature of non recrystallization is increased by these niobium. Uh, additions, yes, okay, to a temperature that's slightly above the temperature you have at the start of the finisher. And so when you deform in the finisher, you can accumulate strain. Mm -hmm. So at the exit of your finisher, your, and you go through the cooling here, where you get the transformation, the transformation from alpha, from gamma to alpha rather, you get nucleation at the grain boundaries, but also in the interior, so you see here at the deformation bands, you get lots of ferrite nucleation, yes? So very fast, much, so faster nu um, uh, kinetics of the transformation and much finer grain sizes, all right? So that's, that's the difference. That's where it happens basically in the, in a, for instance, hot strip mill, okay? So, um, What we talked about just now is, is how uh, people are controlling the grain size, yes? One of the, um, and, and controlling the grain size to change the strength, basically. But if you can't do this, you know, how, how do we change the strength in steels, yes? Uh, in an easy way, well, well, the easy way to do it, standard easy way to do it in, and it's still used very widely for constructional steels, yes, is basically to work with ferrite perlite microstructure. This is a typical ferrite perlite microstructure. Metallography is ferrite and this is perlite, yeah. And so the, the the mechanical properties that we get depend almost entirely on the carbon content yes, of, the, uh, of the steel. Hmm? Because the mechanical properties depend on the mechanical properties of the cementite phase I have, the ferrite phase I have, and the volume fraction of perlite. Hmm? So let's first of all have a look at what, what I mean by this. 
Okay, okay. So in your ferrite, yes, your, in, in your um, const uh, uh, ferrite perlite steel, hmm, you, you have basically ferrite and perlite. The ferrite is a, a phase that's relatively soft. So if you look at the stress strain curve, this is what you have, yes, for the ferrite. If you look at the perlite here, yes, the perlite contains two phases, yes, ferrite and cementite, okay? So basically, one of the phases in this constituent will have this stress strain curve, and the other one is a carbide, it's very, very, very hard, yes, has this stress strain curve. Actually, nobody really knows how the stress strain curve of cementite is because usually it breaks before it ever, you can make um, bulk cementite, but it always breaks before you can give it any plastic deformation. So, but it probably has a, a yield string of around 3,000, yes? So the cement, the, excuse me, the, these two phases, the cementite and the uh, ferrite together act as form a composite, yes? And, our, and, and the stress strain curve that I have will be for the perlite, hmm? the stress strain will be somewhere in between, yeah? Okay. All right. So if I look at the tensile strength, yes, of a ferrite perlite microstructure, it depends on the carbon content, yes, but what it actually, what you actually uh, change when you change the carbon content, yes, is you basically increase the amount of perlite, yes. So when you have 100% of perlite, that's at around 0.8%, yes, you, the typical strength is about a thousand, yes. If you have around, uh, so that would be 0.4% uh, of carbon, you have about 50% of perlite, 50% of ferrite, yes? And so that gives me 700 megapascal of yield strength. And that is certainly for when it comes to um, commercial constructional steels, that's basically the way strength is controlled. By changing the amount of carbon, yes, which changes the amount of perlite in the microstructure. Hmm? Now, that's, that's, it that's very simple, yes, uh, not too difficult. You can see uh, that you can um, basically design your steel just basically by changing the carbon content, yes. Uh, but there's one problem is uh, the more you add carbon, the more hardenable your steel becomes. So it, the easier it forms very hard and brittle martensite when you weld it, yes? And that is a big problem because we, we like to weld steel. We like to weld steel to make things, yeah, to, to, to join things. Yeah. And uh, so, so that's a problem. So, you can make uh, stronger uh, steels, but they're, they don't have good weld, welding properties, okay? Good. So, but let's have a look now at, uh, at these, uh, the properties. Just, let's just forget about the welding for a moment, and let's just see um, how these properties change with um, the carbon content. So the, uh, as, as you increase the carbon content, yes, you have, so steels which are uh, hypo-eutectoid, uh, and then you have steel which are hyper-eutectoid. You see that as we increase the amount of carbon, the yield strength increases, yes, and the tensile strength increases. And if you can't measure these things, you can measure the hardness, and the hardness also increases. Yeah. Um, the, uh, 
what, what you also see is that the material, as you um, increase the carbon, the amount of elongation drops, yes, and the material doesn't have what we call impact toughness. Um, so it's, it, it's less tough. So it may be strong, but you can't really do anything with it in terms of formability. It becomes very hard to weld, yes? And, um, and then it's, it loses toughness. So the approach of adding carbon, yes, is to control the strength is interesting, but of obviously limited uh, uh, potential for many, many products. Okay. Well, let's uh, play around a little bit with um, the, um, this microstructure. First of all, uh, you may remember that we could change the perlite microstructure by uh, forming it. By f when you form perlite at lower temperatures, you get the refinement of the perlite. So, when you have fine perlite in the microstructure, yes, you get an, a high strength. If the, the perlite is coarse, the strength decreases. Yes. If you spherodize the perlite, so you replace the perlite with big uh, 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 inclusions, bigger inclusions of cementite, you get an even lower um, uh, strength, yes? And you can see the, the effect on the, the formability uh, is, is uh, improved as you, you change things from cementite, excuse me, from perlite to spherodite. The other way. Okay. There was another thing we could do with steels, with exactly the same steels, is instead of cooling them slowly, yes, or holding them isothermally to get the formation of, uh, to get the um, perlite uh, transformation, you can quench the material, yes. And if you quench the material, so instead of having what we just saw, a hardness increasing linearly with the percentage of carbon, now you get a huge increase of the strength because we have carbon supersaturation in martensite. So you get a very high hardness uh, material, yes? because uh, martensite is, of course, much harder than the uh, perlite. Hmm? And uh, we use, this is used, there, there are many things that, that, uh, that we make, uh, which are basically based on starting from ferrite perlite microstructures, yes, and then rapidly quenching them so you get martensite, yes? And you can see, depending on the application, yes? If you want to make screws or structural steels or forging, dies, drills, files, yes? Uh, you will have, you will increase the carbon content because you do want very hard, um, a very, very hard uh, material, yes? Now, in many situations, we don't use the martensite as such, but we apply a heat treatment, which is called tempering. Yes, tempering. And you see that now material is still uh, quite uh, hard, but there is a considerable reduction in the, uh, the hardness. And that the reason why this happens is because, yes, is because uh, if you uh, look at the microstructure in the 
a microscope, you see that uh, these are the martensite lats, yes, that inside these lats you have these little, very tiny little needles have appeared, and these are carbides. Yes? But remember, remember that the carbon is in supersaturation. When you do this aging, so you hold the martensite at, say, 200 degrees for, say, an hour, yes, the carbon will go out of uh, solution and form cementite, yes, iron carbides, yes, and they're, very, they're extremely small, yes, okay, and as a consequence, uh, I, I, you get a considerable reduction in the strength, and you can, you can make the material really soft if you go, if you do the annealing to, for instance, 600 degrees C, that's a very high um, um, tempering temperature, by the way. Okay? And tempering is usually applied because you, 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 know, you want to avoid these, the very strong brittleness of, of, uh, of martensite. So the brittleness of martensite is what you want to avoid. Um, in addition, uh, very often you also re remove internal stresses that are caused by the quenching. Okay, so you, important you get a loss of strength, but an increase in what, what's called here uh, RA, which stands for reduction of area. Maybe I should go back a slide or so. Uh, because I did not, yes, here. So when, when you have a, uh, a, a, a you, you carry out a tensile test on a bar-shaped material, bar-shaped tensile specimen. Um, so it breaks here. You get, first you get your um, neck region, diffuse neck region, and then eventually you get a fracture. The, uh, you measure the area here, and you measure the area you had originally, yes? And the reduction of area, so A0 minus A at fracture, yes, divided by A0 times 100, that's the reduction of area. Okay, so, so if, if the reduction of area is very large, yes, so if, if AF is very small, yes, then, um, you have a very um, ductile, uh, much more ductile material. All right. So tempering of martensite. So basically, in a nutshell, when you have austenite, uh, you do slow coolings, you get uh, perlite, Ferrite and so basically ferrite and cementite, and uh, alpha is a very often proeutectoid uh, phase. Yes, certainly when we have proeutectoid uh, carbon uh, contents in our steels. Do moderate cooling, you will tend to have decomposition to bainite. The microstructure will also be more plate-like and needle-like. Do rapid quenching you get martensite. Martensite is diffusionless transformation, and very often because the phase, this, this constituent rather, is very brittle, we will do a reheating, a tempering, which will give us tempered martensite, yes? And basically that's ferrite with very fine cementite particles, and also the microstructure is plate-like or needle-like, hmm? lath martensite, as, as um, uh, uh, we discussed. Uh, uh, important with the tempering is that the tempering usually doesn't change the, the microstructure, the crystallographic and lath microstructure of martensite. The only thing that really happens is you precipitate this, this cementite uh, small uh, cementite particles. In fact, um, 
the martensite uh, microstructure is, is very resistant to recrystallization. Yeah. Okay, so this is, again, in a nutshell, a little bit more visual. Uh, martensite, tempered martensite, bainite, fine perlite, coarse perlite, and spheroidite. This, in this sequence, you go from hard and less ductile materials to constituents to more ductile and softer materials, yes? Okay. Before we end, there is, there are a few things, um, one thing um, we need to um, discuss and that is um, related to this uh, recrystallization. Yeah? Um, uh, very often, in, um, when we do uh, thermal treatments, um, we will do thermal treatments which we call annealing treatments. Yes? Um, and they're not all the same, these annealing treatments. Hmm? So first of all, um, let's look at one uh, 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 treatment, uh, annealing treatment, which we, um, which is important, but haven't uh, discussed it yet, um, and is related to recrystallization heat treatment. Uh, why why is that important in um, in steels, in particular for ferritic steels and um, even for um, stainless steels, hot when they are hot rolled. So when you do hot working of, uh, of steel, hmm? what we usually have is the material will recrystallize, yes? Hmm? And um, that uh, feature of recrystallization allows us to deform the material very heavily, yes? Because you deform the material, like for instance you have these big forgings, you deform them, yes? They don't strain harden. You get recrystallization and the material becomes soft again. So the next time you hit, the material hasn't gotten stronger. Yes? It's still the same um, you know, soft material at high temperature. Yes? So you get uh, lower strength, lower energy to deform. There is, of course, at the surface there, um, you'll, you'll get oxidation. It's not so important at this stage. Okay, so, but we also cold deform materials, yes? And in this case, there is no recrystallization. We will need energy to deform, and the more we deform, the more we harden the material and the more energy we will need, yes? So increased strength, yes? Um, of course, there are good reasons for, for doing cold deformations is because, uh, for instance, there's no oxidation, you get better surface finish, you get also better dimensional control because of the low temperatures. You can imagine that at, when you do rolling at 1,000 degrees C, uh, the equipment, everything is thermally expanded, yes? And so it's more difficult to get uh, uh, the, the, the dimensional tolerances are much uh, uh, more difficult to meet. However, the microstructures you get after cold working is a deformed microstructure, yes? The grains you can see here, this grain microstructure, um, is, you know, consists of uh, deformed, strained uh, grains. So, and, and uh, a cold deformed uh, microstructure is usually, uh, you cannot use, yes? So you need to recrystallize, you know, to obtain the properties, you know? For instance, uh, this is an example here of a hot rolled stainless steel. So hot rolling can, uh, uh, when the steels are, are uh, heavily alloyed, like stainless steels, uh, even, even after hot rolling, they will not be recrystallized. Yes? So anyway, so this is an example of this. You can see the grains are all very flattened, very long, it's much strained, they have high dislocation density. And Recrystallization allows you to get coarser grains and, of course, very low uh, dislocation density. So you get 
a material that's ready for use in a certain application. Okay? Okay, so there are different types of annealing processes. Of course, one of them is, is the one we just discussed, is this recrystallization um, to obtain the final properties. Yeah? Annealing itself uh, can be very complex. Yeah? But usually we, we say, well, you, you, um, you heat it up, certain uh, heating rate, you hold it at that temperature for some time, uh, and then you cool it. Yeah? So not necessarily will annealing be this simple. Yes? And not only the, 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 the maximum temperature and the time at which you keep it there are important. Heating rates may be important and cooling rates may also be very important. Yes? So, and, and as we go, we'll, we'll see some examples of this. Hmm? But in general, you know, let's, let's uh, keep things simple. Um, we have stress relief annealing. So basically that's stress. You, you have internal stresses in your material. One of the ways you, you can um, remove them is by annealing. Hmm? You don't need to go to very high temperatures there. Relieving stress only requires a rearrangement of the defects of the dislocations in your microstructure. So it only needs recovery, yes, recovery processes to be active. Spherodization is very much used. It's an annealing process, which you, uh, you make very uh, soft steel, for instance, for easy machining or easy um, uh, wire drawing, yes. It's a very long process, yes whereby your cementite uh, is spherodized. Cementite in the starting perlite is uh, spherodized. Full annealing. Hmm? Um, here you get, again, good forming by heating and cooling. And what you're basically trying to get is, is you want to coarsen your perlite. Normalization, that's often, is used very often, yes. That is a way to uh, uh, reduce the grain size. So how do you reduce the grain size? Well, remember that when you do the transformation, yes, the nucleation of the, the, new, the new phase is at grain boundaries. So if you go through the, you heat over the AR3 temperature, you get one transformation. You cool down, you get another transformation that will refine the grain just by going to true transformation. And then there is also process anneal. Yeah? Process anneal is, uh, is the name we use for recrystallization annealing. Mm -hmm. So if we look at a, uh, a diagram here, mm -hmm. a phase diagram here, mm -hmm. so normalizing, you, you do a full, um, a full uh, transformation, yes? Recrystallization annealing, you, the only thing you want to do, sorry, um, normalizing, you do uh, full transformation. Process annealing, you just do a recrystallization, right? So you, you heat up, you don't go through transformation, yes, and you cool down. Why wouldn't you want to go through transformation? Well, maybe you don't want to destroy certain features of the microstructure, such as crystallographic texture, yes? In many cases, that's one of the reasons why you, you, know, the, the, you do the recrystallization annealing only, yeah? If you do stress relief, yes, you don't want to recrystallize the microstructure. You don't want to soften it. You just want to remove internal stresses, yeah? So you just go for recovery process, yeah? yeah so much lower temperature, and then the spherodization, yes, we, we don't want to dissolve the cementite. We just want it to coarsen, right? So we stay below as high temperature as possible, but we stay below the AE1 temperature. 
uh, for an extended time. Okay, and I think, yes, so I guess you could uh, read this on your, your slide. So we've come to the end of this, uh, this introduction. Um, so all these concepts we've discussed are kind of um, understood that um, you, you know about these when, uh, when we'll account the products. The first thing we'll do uh, on Monday is to, to go into steel standards. You need to know a little bit about steel standards because that's, um, uh, of course, you know, when you sit in school, you always learn about physical metallurgy, this and physical metallurgy, but you never learn about real products, yes? So we'll start off by talking a little bit about uh, uh, real products and how they are um, organized uh, in the industry, okay? See you on Tuesday next week.